Well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. My name is Keith Strom. I'm the executive director of the Hemingway Foundation. And we're excited to have this uh, book talk this evening. Um, the foundation itself uh, obviously was uh, founded on the mission of uh, uh, restoring and uplifting the legacy of Hemingway and certainly the, the Oak Park legacy of Hemingway. And over time, we've uh, expanded that mission to be more in terms of trying to become more of a community cornerstone and supporting artists in all their various forms, uh, hearing uh, writer stories and presenting those stories to you. So it's uh, fitting that we have this book talk this evening with Ken Trainer, um, who's specifically focused on the Oak Park community and has been kind of the diarist of for all of us uh, uh, for a long time now. And I, I think and I. Uh, confidently say is uh, shared many of the thoughts and feelings we have about various subjects in the community itself so but we're also fortunate well you're all fortunate that I will not be moderating this discussion <laughs> but rather we will have William ha uh, Hazelgrove uh, moderating the discussion uh, and uh, Mr. Hazelgrove is a uh, best-selling author uh, has a master's in history has uh, written over 20 some books I want to say 10 novels, 12 narrative nonfiction. His latest is the uh, uh, on Teddy uh, Roosevelt and the story of the Rough Riders. And he actually will have another book coming out next year about uh, Hemingway uh, and uh, his years in the 1950s called Hemingway's Attic. And with that, no further ado, I will present Mr. Hazelgrove to uh, lead us in this evening. So I am introducing Ken Trainer. Uh, actually, I met Ken way back when, when um, I had one of my first books come out, and he did an interview uh, with me, and uh, you know, and of course, I'd never done interviews before, so I was just an idiot when I was talking about everything and blathering, but he was great. So I'm going to give you just sort of a background on him. Ken Trainer is a free-range Catholic who spent the seven years immediately following the Vatican, um, if in uh, Vatican II, in the Chicago Arch. Diocesan Seminary System. That's amazing. He left the seminary to study in Rome, then completed his BA in Literature at Loyola University of Chicago. I was at Western. That's just, this is so impressive. <laughs> so, uh, it's like, I was like in kindergarten. Some years later, he added a master's degree in creative writing from Colorado State University. A storyteller, chronicler of life, and occasional provocateur. Great word. He had been a free-range community journalist and newspaper editor in Oak Park, Illinois for the past 32 years with growing community media, donning almost every hat that needed wearing, including editor of the Forest Park Review, Austin Weekly News, and Wednesday Journal of Oak Park River Forest. We're now semi-retired. He attempts to rescue the pros of harried reporters on deadline, referees the opinion pages, and tends the obituaries with tender, loving care. Since 1985, he has honed his storytelling skills. I'm going to put on my glasses so I look more intellectual. Um, he has honed his storytelling skills as a weekly columnist for newspapers, ranging from Fort Collins, Colorado, to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, to Oak Park, proving with the latter that you can go home again. In the 1990s, he wrote a monthly parenting column for Chicago Parent Magazine, for which his son Dylan, now 39, was frequently the focus. His two grandsons, Tyler and Bryce, age nine, are a recurring focus of his latest testimonials. His one-year-old granddaughter, Charlotte, aka Charlie, has expanded his grandparenting duties, not to mention providing more material for columns. He has been named best columnist in the weekly newspaper category by the Illinois Press Association four times. Over a span of 38 years in three different states, he has written over 2,000 columns, and yet somehow, Hasn't run out of things to say. <laughs> in the distant past, he taught high school religion in Chicago, composition courses at Colorado State University, and even led a grant-funded language arts workshop titled Creative Generations, which brought together fourth graders and residents of a local nursing home. Born and raised in Oak Park, the hometown of Ernest Hemingway, and for a good stretch, Frank Lloyd Wright, he traveled in Europe, South America, Cuba, Jordan, and Israel. Seeking, I mean, I've gone as far as Peoria. This guy's amazing. <laughs> you know, seek, seeking more grist for the mill. I'm so provincial compared to this guy. His first book, We Dare to Say, An Adventure in Journaling, was published by ACTA Publications in 2007. 
His second book, Unfinished Pentecost, Vatican II, and the Altered Lives of Those Who Witnessed It, wow, was published in 2013 and is available at Amazon.com. His third book, Our Town Oak Park, Walk With Me in Search of True Community, will be released in April. I give you Ken Trainer. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> All right. So what I thought we'd do is I, I went through his, um, got a hate glass. I went through his book and tore it to pieces. You can see here it's just earmarked and written in. And uh, so I just thought I'd be, act like a catalyst and sort of speed things up for him and maybe hit some sparks and then let Ken take over and just, you know, entertain us. Not, not take over tear, but comment. And then I'll come and back in. Questions from the audience are good too. Yeah, that too. Yeah, we'll have a lot of questions for those. Um, okay. All right, all right. Oh, okay, so, you know, Ken and I were talking before, and I said, you know, when you look at Oak Park from like the Hancock, it's like this group of trees, and then everywhere else are buildings. <laughs> and so, yeah, I was, oh, I was like, oh, that's Oak Park. And so, you know, it's really surrounded, right? It's surrounded by Austin, surrounded by Berwyn, uh, surrounded by North Chicago, surrounded by Maywood. And then there's Oak Park, which is a very different community unto itself, right? And as I was reading Ken's book, um, and we were talking about this before, I felt like, you know, he has a real Winesburg, Ohio sort of approach to it. You know, his ruminations and stuff, uh, you know, it, it, you would think this is a is little town, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere, but it's not. <laughs> it's it's right here. So uh, it has two L lines. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. I don't. I don't know where I'm going with all this. Yes, exactly. Uh, so you know, <laughs> one of the first things, um, the one of the first essays, and then I'm gonna get off my phone. I'll be looking through the book. Is uh, you talk a lot about diversity. In Oak Park, and you, you know, Oak Park has this history of of trying to integrate people and getting together, and then you brought up the block parties, mm -hmm. which, you know, when I lived here, I don't live here anymore, but I did, I really enjoyed those, and they were, but you pointed out, hey, this was a way to get people together, to, to sort of mix people up, black and white, and you know, try and integrate people. So, I mean, do you want to talk about that? you want to comment on that? And, you know, just that whole, that whole concept of trying to get very diverse people to interact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when the, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the open housing era, um, as African-American families moved in to town, uh, there was a lot of tension. And uh, block parties were one of the, uh, was probably the biggest tool in the toolbox at that point, um, just to encourage people to get to know each other. And um, it's, uh, I don't know if block parties were invented before Oak Park. Do you know anything about them? <laughs> uh, you know, I, all I can tell you is out, out where I am, they don't exist. I live out in St. Charles and um, and you know, when we moved out there, we were in shock because of a lot of reasons. Um, you know, not to get political, but we were liberal Democrats and it's very red out there and all that. So uh, people weren't very interested in getting to know you. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that hit me because we were very used to park where the village, everybody, you know, they're interested in you. And out there, I, we were, I was like, wow, that's not the case here. Yeah. People are more interested in making a lot of money. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, Oak Park, that sort of integrating effect of Oak Park, where not just to the color lines, but just people. People are more socially driven, it seemed to me. It hit, it hit me about Oak Park, that they put social relationships first yeah. over, over other things, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And not that they aren't driven. I mean, on my street, we had... Two architects, two doctors, two lawyers, one writer. He brought down the bell curve. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, every, you know, uh, the prof two professors. Uh, one was chairman of the department. Uh, DePaul. So I mean, all this brain power, 
And that was another thing too I noticed when, I know I'm gonna get this crucified for saying this stuff, I, when I went west was that the professionals really weren't there. They're more corporate, more people work in corporate settings. So, so I thought, well, why is it? Why is all these people who settle in you know, this heavy duty brain power settling in Oak Park? I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. Um, not I so mean, much, sans me. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, um, you know, the village government had to get involved in the 60s and try to, um, you know, make sure that all of this happened peace peacefully. And one of the things they did was go around to different blocks where they had a sense that there were people who were not going to accept black families moving in. And they would uh, go in and, and the police chief would be involved. Uh, the pastor at Ascension Church where I was growing up was getting involved. I found out even my dad was going around and talking people down. Mm -hmm. So that before they moved in, they were at least prepared for it. And, and then once, you know, I mean, block parties are fun no matter what. They're going to they're gonna work, uh, you know, in any situation no matter what the demographics but in this case you know it was kind of all new yeah I mean, there were black families before this the you know the uh, um, uh, Julians the most notably uh, and of course they got met with a couple of fire bombs before they really settled in um, and faith is still in the community and in that house uh, in spite of all that, um, but uh, you know, it, the the block parties eased a lot of tension, and uh, and so, but it went even beyond that. I mean, and, and that's in terms of my book. Um, I've got a story that um, really moved me when I did it. Um, a, about a guy named Glenn Toppin, who um, his family was um, across the street from the Sanders, who had actually come from Germany, um, different kinds of diversity. And uh, they were, it turns out that her crystals, the mom, the daughter, um, needed a kidney. And it was, touch and go, um, what her prospects were. Uh, and she, Crystal was talking to Diane Toppin, Glenn's wife, and mentioned uh, the situation. Diane went home that night and talked to Glenn and said, uh, and her blood type is, I forget which one, what it was, and he said, that's my blood type. And he volunteered right away to give her a kidney. Wow. Um, which is always, you know, a, a notable sacrifice. Um, and it worked. Things went well. And it, it, it indicates, you know, just the capacity of what a block party can do. Wow, yeah. But this story goes even further because when I did my first book talk, I decided to get in touch with Crystal to see how it was going because it had been 20 years since I did this story. And she said, well, it's mixed. Well, first of all, Glenn Toppin had died within 10 years of congestive heart failure. It wasn't related to the kidney. But uh, Cynthia, the daughter, um, was fine with the kidney, ended up marrying a guy in Canada, and they have a child. But she's now suffering from a chronic illness, mm. and it, her future is kind of up in the air. So Crystal and Diane came to the, uh, the first book talk and they brought me a packet of stuff about Glenn so that I got to know him a lot better than I knew him in that very brief interview I did 20 years ago. Um, it turned out he was an interesting guy, fascinating guy. He was working in social services most of his life. He had trouble with alcohol and beat it. Um, you know, there was a lot more to the story and, uh, you know, Cynthia's case up in Canada, having that, uh, that illness was also much more to the story.
And it made me realize when you're telling a story, those stories go on when you're done interviewing. And uh, look at you. They're interviewing you in the attic. Now you've <laughs> written 20 books. It's like I take full credit for... Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. For, uh, well, I did it. In all my I, dedication, I, like... It was a launch. It was after the interview with Ken that I was inspired <laughs> for 20 books. Yes, please say that. Yeah. <laughs> now... Any, anyway, I was, I was going to say that um, it's... Uh, it's kind of humbling to hear that, hear all that, and know that um, this story goes on. And even if Cynthia, for some reason, doesn't make it, she's got a son, and that story is going to go on. And uh, it doesn't work out the way you hope it will work out, happily ever after. But it's uh, when you tell a story, wow, does it open up a lot? I mean, I used to think I was. I used to feel like I was outside of, you know, well, sitting on the sidelines as a journalist, being objective and, you know, listening and observing and then writing about it. And n lately I've been feeling like I'm out in the, on the field and up to my neck in community, <laughs> which is not something I ever thought would happen, and I'm really glad it did. That's great. So. Yeah. And that's just because you feel like now you're just totally involved and more integrated into the community. You aren't, you aren't standing off as a journalist and looking, right. you know, in that third person sort of looking at it. Right. And, and you know, I mean, if you're a journalist for a while, you know that it's, objectivity's bullshit anyway. And so uh, <laughs> yeah. you have to get involved in order to tell the story better. Right. Right. And, um, and so... And there's just so many stories, so many things to write about. Well, and, and that's the thing in your book, that's what struck me so much is that, you know, everyone, which I'll call vignettes, mm -hmm. um, you know, they are all sort of short stories. Yeah. You start here, yeah. there's an emotional arc to it. Even if you're just, you know, you have a lot of stories about spring and summer and the change in Oak Park which I know very well because I was that guy too going, was it ever going to heat up, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but even those, you, know, you, you have this arc where it's almost like a Saturday Evening Post story, you know, sort of Fitzgerald that way where it's like a one, two, three hop. And by the end, mm -hmm. you have the little, you know, the uh, little bit of irony right there at the top of it and then you come back around and then you finish it up. Mm -hmm. And so each one is like, I must say, yeah, this is almost like a little short story. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, now I want to move on to something super, super important here, Ken, that you wrote about, and that is the farmer's market oh. and the donuts there. <laughs> because the donuts are the one thing that, among many things, I mean, when I moved, I immediately wanted to move back to a park. But I always said to my wife, I'm like, I got to go back and get those freaking donuts, man. <laughs> I'm like, they are so good, those cinnamon donuts. Um, and, well, but just the whole farmer's market thing community i mean i always love going there and just seeing everybody there yeah and the guys playing you know and the little sort right. of fall lumineers band it's, it's prairie home it, companions yeah you know? it is it is it is i'm like this is such a throwback and again i bring up winesburg ohio you know yeah just, right uh, and people are you know catching up on each other and yeah saying goodbye sometimes people are moving out of town you know they're welcoming new people in it's, uh, it's, it's a real microcosm of uh, what happens in this town because, as I say in various places, this town is never the same two days in a row. People are, some people are leaving, some people are arriving, especially now with you know, the, that whole migrant story. Um, it's underscored uh, greatly. So, um, yeah, I, I love Farmer's Market in terms of what it does. It's another tool in our... You know, um, being able to not only attract diversity, but going beyond living next to each other to interaction and becoming interconnected. And that's where true community starts to take place. Right, right. I mean, that's, and that's, that's ex exactly one of the things that just, it, you hit in so many of your stories. It's just like, you know, community, village. And, you know, even like you had that one story about playing ball with your son. Yeah. Which I totally relate to because that's what I, I did with Clay when he was younger, too. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was in a group called Oak Park Dads, which was a bunch of guys that would get together and go out and have a drink at Poor Phil's. And, 
you know, and um, and I don't know, you know, again, you know, the Oak Park dads were uh, a group of guys who all really, you know, put their kids first. Yeah. And uh, I bummed into a lot of people who don't do that. And I thought, well, is this an Oak Park thing too? You know, it's just something that kid that, you know, this family is just more important to people here. I mean, you know, it just seems like, the, and then your stories, you constantly are talking about the various families that move in, move out, and these houses that change over. Yeah. And, and, you're, and, you know, there's that one great scene you have where you're sitting in, I think it was a house across from your old house. Yeah. Right. And you were watching people move into that. Uh, yeah, actually, um, it was, it's on uh, 600 block of Elmwood, and um, somebody had, you know, moved into our house already um, years ago. But I was on the porch with people who were just moving out of their house and watching somebody, a girl from high school perhaps, getting dropped off and going into the house of Don Madigan, who I knew from childhood, who had been on the, was it the USS Missouri, where the, uh, where the, where the uh, peace treaty was signed in Japan. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd gotten to know him and done stories about him. I knew his history. She had no idea about any of that, of course. But when you, uh, when you get that tied in and you get to know people for that long and you grew up here, which I did, um, you, you know the backstories and it, it just sort of deepens the experience. And, but it also deepens the experience of watching community take place in the here and now because it, it resonates more. And do you think it's because of the, the housing stock in Oak Park is finite? And that these homes really do circulate. They really do. Yeah. Sort of one family comes out, one comes out. Because you know, out where I am, it's sprawl land where they mm -hmm. just just keep building, right? And it just it's just not that feeling. But here, it feels like somebody's a steward of a house for a while, and then somebody comes and takes it over. Right. You know. You know, and these and these people were um, they had had the walk through, and then they invited me over to have a drink, a last drink on their porch. And so, you know, we were talking about their memories from right. living there for 30 some years, you know, and it's like there's all this stuff going on, you know, and it's like this is not superficial. Right, and right. I, and I knew the people who lived there before them. I went to school with their daughter. Oh, okay. And, uh, right, so it's generationally just right. bang, 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 bang. Yeah. Now, you have, um, stupid phone, um, you have one essay I'll call it, uh, called Oak Park Cool. Oh yeah. Okay, and, uh, and, and, I, and I really enjoyed it, I re, you know, I read it, and I was like, you know, where you say, you know, what is Oak Park Cool, why is this? And that really hit me because uh, we did the um, Lincoln Park, Wrigleyville thing. I mean, my whole block was from Lincoln Park. Everybody did the live in the city for a while and then come out to the cool place, Oak Park, <laughs> and uh, and you know to because go to we, school because we don't want to live in the suburbs, but we want to live in Oak Park, which is you know technically not you know in our brains, and uh, and uh, and it was because you know yeah Hemingway is cool, but you know it just it, it was known as a trendy place. Full disclosure, we did check out Evanston too. That was cool, but that was expensive, so we <laughs> ended up in Oak Park, cool. Um, but you know uh, you know what what. It, Oak Park's become very expensive now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's maybe it, you know. I mean, it's you know. More, I come back. I come back a lot, and I see these big buildings and these high rises and the townhome stuff. And I know a lot more five hundred thousand plus and stuff. So Oak Park is a pretty affluent community now. Uh, can you be cool, hip, and edgy when you know you've got this super strong upper middle class now sort of pushing up and you know. Yeah, that's the question for going on f with a lot of people because of the high rises and, you know, it's attracting new people and, you know, will they buy into sort of the Oak Park ethic? Will right. they find it charming or will they use it as a, a bedroom community? Um, those questions, I, I tend to think optimistically that 
that we have a track record. I call it um, our interpersonal I infrastructure, that we actually have things set up like block parties and farmer's market and, um, oh, what are some of the other things that we do? Uh, any, you know, July 4th parades, Thursday night out. Many colors, one dream parade. Is that, is that still going on? There was a parade that used to- Fourth of to, July? Uh, no, it, when we first moved out here, we had kids, and we were like, wow, it's really quiet out here. Went, you know, I don't know if this is gonna work. And, uh, and, uh, and- Gorofobia um, in Oak Park, that's a, that's a first. I'm telling you, I was like, <laughs> I, I lived in 537 North Kyler. And so, okay. um, um, my wife goes, you won't believe what's coming down the street. And this parade came down, it was, I think it was called Many Colors, One Dream. I think it was oh, that a was a uh, uh, Whittier parade, was it? Multicultural. Multi multicultural, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And I'm like, wow, I'm not in Kansas anymore. This is, this is a very different community. What's it called? The diversity? Diver it was the ethnic. 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 ethnic okay. Parade. All right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And that yeah. went on for a long time. Yeah. Uh, my son marched in it, played trumpet. Um, See, so I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't no, having yeah, this, like, like okay. Yeah, that was, it, it was, uh, you know, the first weekend of, of May, which is always perilous around here because it could be anywhere from, you know, 30 to uh, 70. And, uh, right. But it, was, uh, but it was a great thing. It was, uh, this was, you know, Oak Park proclaiming, you know, that they want to, um, that celebrating diversity. Right. And uh, of course, we all know that that only is, goes as far as as your words, you also have to follow it up with action, which is kind of where Oak Park is right now, which is moving from celebrating our history of being of tolerance and diversity and all of that and moving forward to actual real equity for all the residents. Well, I'm glad you said that because you segue right into my next right. question here, my <laughs> next discussion point. Okay, so you had a, a vignette on the, um, Filming that went on at OPRF, they made that film. Yes, yeah, Steve James. Okay. Yeah, America to me. Right, which I I didn't see, um, but it sounded fascinating when I was reading your your piece on it. It's worth and, seeing. It's really good. Okay, yeah. So now, in your piece, um, you said, and you know, um, I think this is you saying, it, not them saying it, but I think you're paraphrasing. You say everything is is made for white kids because this school is uh, this is. Maybe this was the kid saying or Yeah, it was the kid. Okay. Everything's made for white kids because the school is made for white kids because this country was made for white kids. And you write, are, and this is what you write, are we willing to face up to the racism inherent in any institution made for white kids or will we defend consciously or unconsciously white privilege while paying lip, surfer, lip service to leaving no child behind? Yeah. And that's kind of the, where we are at this point, um, confronting that. And... Um, I say in, in, in there a few places, I, I love that Oak Park right off the bat in the 60s raised the bar mm -hmm. over most other communities. But recently, um, in the last, what, uh, it's 10 years or so, you know, we've been confronted by needing to raise the bar even more. And, um, we, uh, I remember, you know, that I thought I was congratulating myself, patting myself on the back for being so enlightened, you know, on this issue. And then, um, who was it in uh, Missouri? Michael Brown. Yeah. And when that happened, it became clear to me that I wasn't that far <laughs> ahead of anybody on this issue. And, um, what was it, Michael Brown? What was that? When he was killed, it, pardon? Yeah, he was, no, that's fine. He was killed by, uh, you know, the police officer. Shot oh, and, okay. And then that place erupted, and I heard an awful lot of people trying to defend the police officer immediately, white people, anyway. And as it became clear, the kind of conditions that town was living in under, um, it became obvious the whole notion of white dominance sort of emerged. And that was, you know, it was like, 
oh man, I got some learning to do, you know? And um, I think all of us maybe have, have uh, thought that a little bit in the last 10 years. And um, so Oak Park, you know, has to raise the bar further. But, you know, thank God we raised the bar at once and have the track record we have mm -hmm. because it makes it easier for the community to adjust to some of these things. There's a whole lot, many parts of this country where they're still dealing with whether it's a white dominant society, you know, it's like, which is like pretty obvious to everybody mm -hmm. here anyway, in this town. And um, so it's, our story is never over, you know. Uh, we have a great track record but it doesn't mean anything if we don't keep going. Right, right. And what I like in, in, the, uh, in that piece about America to me is um, they kept talking about we're not there yet. And to me that becomes kind of a motto for Oak Park. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. But that word yet is really important. Yeah. Because it means there's hope. It means there's a commitment, determination to actually get there. And we'll see, you know, I mean, I suppose it's always possible Parker will go backward, but I just don't believe it will. Yeah. Now, you write a lot about children and kids and graduation and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Oak Park is a very much a, uh, a very much a, a, a liberal core or sort of a progressive community. Yet the whole country's right of center, mostly. I mean, right. you go out, you know, right. where I am in. Yeah. Everything's right of center, and some people are really right of center. And so when kids raised in Oak Park, which is incredibly unique, you know, mm -hmm. I really realized how unique it was when I moved out. How do you think they carry, how do they, they carry this view of the world with them into the world that has a very different view? Well, that's what we all hope for with our, uh, our kids. And... Um, uh, Pat Healy here, I yeah, was involved in, Camille, you were involved with Project Unity, weren't you? Um, not really. Okay. I don't know if anybody else was, but you know, we started this uh, group in the thir uh, 30 years ago, back when I was just starting, and I went to cover it and then joined it, you know, which I, I never was very good at being objective. <laughs> so, um, you know, and uh, they were confronting the same issue. Our kids are relating to each other in school, and we want to make sure that that keeps going, and that eventually they bring that into their adulthood and into the rest of the world when they when we launch them, if they if they launch, and um, and yet and and we asked the kids, you know, what their opinion was, and they said, well. We have uh, friends of different color, but we don't see that with you guys. You're not socializing much with people of other color, you know, of people of color. And so uh, Project Unity was dedicated to trying to get over that and basically not make it so heavy. We tried to have a good time together. And we did a pretty good job for a long time, but nobody has picked that up. We tried. Yeah. We tried to sell the idea and right. give the, the money that was left over and stuff, but yeah, nobody picked it up. Right. So, um, but we talked about that as it, as we shut it down when the pandemic came, and um, in fact, I, you know, I have a chapter called the time capsule for things that are you know now in the past, and I put Project Unity in there, which I didn't really like doing, but I did. Um, but we talked about. We have to ask the kids, the adult kids now, that they're out on their own, what they think. Was that, was Oak Park any good for them? Are they carrying it on? Are they finding that it's very difficult? Is it a hostile environment out there? Or, um, or are they finding that it, it's changing out there and that they're able to fit in because they lived in Oak Park? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, right, which is the hope, right? Yeah. For example, um, my younger son, who is now 50, is uh, in a book club of 
guys that he went to Oak Park oh, for four. Cool. They've been meeting since they got all got back from college. Mm -hmm. And they all, you know, it's like there's 12 of them. 11 of them moved back to Oak Park. My son moved to Evanston. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's they, interesting. You know, but I mean, they take the, it's, they take it very seriously. The, the reading of uh, which books they're going to read and stuff. So yeah, they is it a diverse group? Huh? Is it a diverse group? No. Okay. No. Yeah. It's, you know, they it's the guys that hung around together in high school, and it's not a diverse group. Yeah. They read books about diversity, but the the uh, no. Yeah, I'm not a sociologist at all, and I didn't try to take that approach in this book, but. Um, Somebody should be studying Oak Park and asking these questions, well, where it succeeded and where it didn't, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, what can we learn from it? It's sort of an ongoing experiment, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. And, and there is a definite, you know, there is a definite Oak Park sensibility. And I can speak to, after you leave it, and you've been gone a while, I meet people who, uh, I met Kevin Maher. He lived in Oak Park, he lived in South Oak Park. And we met at a party and boom, it was just like instant connection, and oh, we, okay. we still get together um, once every two weeks at this bar out there called Stockholm's. And uh, it's just like an instant bond. You know, you know exactly what they're about, mm -hmm. and they know what you're about, you know. And, uh, and we've had this happen with several other people from Oak Park. And our friends from the block have all scattered, they're in California and all these different places. And we, you know, we still stay in contact, and they come in and stuff. So there, there is this you know, Oak Park sensibility. It's, it goes beyond politics. It's something else that is in people who chose to live here, move here. And it, it's, you know, it's, because I thought about that a lot of times. I thought, why is it I can't get along with all these other people, but I can get along with Oak Park people, you know? And uh, um, so, yeah, yeah, right? Come back, right? Well, that's what yeah. I kept saying. My wife's like, you know, like, I'm like, we're moving back, we're moving back, we're moving back. Okay, sell the house. You know, I'm like, I gotta put the sign out front, you know, it yeah. costs my bluff every time. Um, but if, I don't know if you wanna talk about that, this sort of idea, this sense, because, you know, in a lot of your stories, there is that sensibility, you know, it just kind of, well, I mean, from Oak Park, so. Yeah, Makes right. sense. Well, I describe Oak Park as uh, progressive. Um, in fact, I can never remember how I, <laughs> here's my description of Oak Park. A welcoming, diverse, eco-friendly, equity-aspiring, ever-evolving community located at the intersection of independence and interdependence, <laughs> continuity and change. And, nice. you know, it's like we're progressive, but that, that label, I'm so pissed off that that label got uh, hijacked and became an extreme. Oh, you mean when, to, to me, progressive was very moderate, it was in the middle, it was practical, it was let's make progress, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that that's what Oak Parkers are for the most part, is committed to making progress on a number of issues um, related to race, related to gender, related to um, same-sex marriage, uh, now migrants. Yeah. Um, you know, we're constantly going to be challenged in this country, everywhere, and so Oak Parkers have a track record of accepting challenges and facing them. So my thing in this book is it's very much a celebration of Oak Park, and it is not celebrating just the past. It is celebrating where we came from, what we're doing with community now, and where we're headed, at least where we aspire to head. Yeah, you know, and we're not there yet. And it's, it's I try to I try to bring in that idea over and over so this doesn't turn into boosterism. And um, I want to be positive, but I want it to be real. And I'm, and I think that most of these pieces are real. At least I tried to make them that way. And yeah, you bring up the foibles too. I mean, in a yeah. lot of the pieces, you right. you you walk both sides. Of yeah, the you don't fence. have any credibility if you don't. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And well, and also too, you know, you're just talking about. Well, I'll bring another little element into this 
too, and that is that um, in the American dream, most people think of it as a monetary dream, but really, it's a social dream. Mm -hmm. It's um, a quality of life dream. Yeah. It's being able to have time for your kids, your loved ones, a certain quality of life, um, not feeling like you're on the edge of a cliff mm -hmm. and the other shoe's gonna drop, and um, not yeah, being and alone. And you're not alone. And you're not being alone, exactly. Yeah. Which, which I, I think I wanted to segue into that is that, uh, you know, Oak Park is a community, is a very much a village, and I think that kind of American dream, you know, there's that, uh, there's that great scene at the end of uh, A Christmas Story. Everybody's seen that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. The okay. Chinese restaurant? Yeah, okay. That's a great scene. <laughs> but at the very, very end, at the very end, uh, Gavin McLeod's sitting down and he tells his wife, come here, and they sit down and then they look out the window, the snow's coming down, and then they, the camera pans back from the house with the Packard on the side, you know, and it's very, very Americana. But I always thought, well, that's sort of the American dream in a way. You just, you know, you want some stability, you want a, a middle, good middle class life that uh, friends, family, community. And I think, you know, Oak Park, you have a real shot at that, mm -hmm. you know. Unfortunately, a lot of places, there's a high degree of isolation. Uh, you pay a high price uh, for living in these places. And, um, uh, right. and, and there's a trade-off. Yeah. And we've always been economically diverse as well. Um, I don't know, again, the uh, percentages. A sociologist would be able to give that to us, but um, there was an old mayor no, maybe it was, maybe it was the Oakleys editor, Otto. What was his name? I can't think of it. Anyway, he um, called Oak Park the middle class capital of the world. <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's we're in the Midwest. We're in the we're, uh, and we are kind of that. And we are where we've changed is to try to open up and be a welcoming community so that more people can come in and get to the middle class. And especially, I think, people of color. And, uh, but we have people here who are get, just getting by, you know? Yeah. And um, so, and there are people here who are really rich. Um, and uh, I'm right in the middle of those two. <laughs> right, 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 most people are. But, so, so let's talk Hemingway. Um, he, I don't know why I would talk to him anyway, being in this house, but um, <laughs> it's just yes. some house, right? Yeah. Um, so wide lawns, narrow minds, right? Mm -hmm. Famously, how I many? A lot of people say he didn't say it, blah blah blah. Um, but he he loved Oak Park at a point. You know, he didn't want to come back. He just did not want to come back here, um, even you know for I think it was he came back for his father's funeral. Grace, I don't think he did did come back. Thank you. Did you ever come yeah. back? Never. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I thought that was curious. Yeah, and so, so now he could be reacting to this Victor post-Victorian household that was. He, yeah, he was rebellious. Grace's home and Grace's show, and also to yeah. you know, there wasn't a lot of room for some guy who wanted to write, you know, about date rape and things like that up in Michigan, mm -hmm. and 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 you know just you know, cracking open literature and things like that. So I guess, you know, it's fascinating that that Oak Park is what led to this Oak Park, right? Yes, right. I mean, that it's sort of boss right. beyond clave of white, right. white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, all white, dry. It was dry too, right? Oak Park was dry, right? Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then came poor Phil. Yeah, until 1972, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Trendsetter, trendsetter. Ginny Casson was the uh, village clerk who assigned the first uh, license. Oh, did she really? Uh, liquor license, yeah. Oh, that's like fascinating. 1972. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've always thought that was odd too because when I grew up, Oak Park was voting Republican, even well, in the well, 60s. Well, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. the money was here. This, is, this was a very waspy enclave, so yeah. why would they be liberal Democrats? 
Right, ex except the Catholics were moving in. Here we go, a different kind of diversity. I, right. was, I was on the south side in my, it wasn't a ghetto, it was just parochial. I never got up to the north side of town, except to go see Santa Claus at Weebolts and Marshall Fields. So you were a Sox fan? Were you a Sox? I was a Sox fan. Oh my God. Well, you know, that's not. All right, that's it. I can't do that this. Was, I can't know, moderate. The whites, you know, the, uh, Oak Park was the Mason-Dixon line. I mean, you know, it was like uh, it, my dad and a couple of my brothers were Cub fans. A couple of us were White Sox fans. It was, it was not a pretty picture. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But anyway, yes, in um, Oak Park, continued to change. There was a, a genuine revolution in '52, the year I was born, when they voted in the VMA, Village Managers Association, an era of good government. And um, within 10 years, uh, the open housing movement started, mm -hmm. and they were doing the uh, the uh, protest marches led by Harriet Robinet and Mac Robinet. They're from St. Edmunds. Yes. They're a wonderful yeah. Well, here it's not but I mean, that's a wonderful couple. Right. And, and so, even in conservative Oak Park and River Forest, um, they, they took out an ad in 1964. I just wrote about it a few weeks ago. The right of all people to live where they choose. And it was a double page ad with a thousand names. People who were Republican and Democrat. And they were changing. And uh, within five years, they had a fair housing ordinance. And they started facing all of these issues. Everybody was scared. But the important thing was resisting white flight. And they put a lot of things in place, including block parties, <laughs> to resist white flight. Yeah, that's fascinating, because I'm glad you brought that up. So let me ask you this, in stopping white flight, and you, you're saying that occurred in the 50s, is that, no, or was well, it the 60s? It was occurring in the 50s elsewhere. Elsewhere, but they were afraid it was going to happen here. Afraid it was going to happen. Okay, so, so let me ask you this. You cannot put a for sale sign in a front yard in Oak Park. Right. Is that... That was, was that, part of it. That was part of it to stop neighbors seeing other people selling on, I'm out of here too. They, they passed an ordinance uh, that you couldn't do it, but then later another town that had passed that ordinance uh, was sued and it went to the Supreme Court and they said it's not constitutional. In Oak Park, the realtors always all said, it's okay, we're gonna abide by it. So it's technically, I think on the books, it's not, it's not you know, really legal, but nobody puts for sale signs up unless you're... No, you can't. When we sell a house, you cannot put up a for sale sign. You just Well, you can't. Uh, you can't take them to court, but most people will be talked down by the village and say, look, this is the history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how we did it. And even though it's, we can't take you to court, we'd really appreciate it if you would cooperate. Okay. So then the second Oak Park rule was that you can't park on the street overnight. Right. Why can you not do that? What was the genesis of that? I don't know. Is that to make sure that people who live in Oak Park are here and people are not coming from other neighborhoods to stay to hang out here? I mean because I mean I well, got that's a few what the cul-de-sacs were about. Okay, so all right, so all right, so then we'll get the cul de sac. The cul de sacs yeah. that block Austin Avenue. Yeah, right. That was just basically you aren't coming in. Well, it was to make it harder to come in. And which is nowadays looks kind of silly to me. You know, and there's other words for it, but <laughs> yeah. Yes, right, exactly. You're right, yeah. And, um, and and it was it was not a. They're on uh, North Avenue it too. Was not, it was not one of the things we did at our best. Right, right, right. Did that was that in the '60s or um, '70s? '70s. '70s. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. But all this was to sort of stabilize Oak Park. Yeah. And uh, well, that was the idea, and um, I think. And uh, not parking overnight was, they always said it was about street cleaning, but, uh, but I think there's, there were probably elements of that too, you know. Well, Park was, had to, uh, I mean, my own dad said, you know, I, you know, when we moved back here after we were away for 20 years, um, don't live east of Ridgeland. And I was like, come on, dad. 
So he, you know, he was faltering, you know. In but uh, we stuff. were told that too when we moved in. Yeah, and, and, and we lived the East original. <laughs> Oak Park's success is that they did not allow any part or, you know, of the town to resegregate, like Evanston did. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. And um, and so they wanted to uh, to not be like that. Okay. But anyway, how do we get back on this? Yeah, what who knows? about Hemingway? Anyway? How they could stop that if people wanted to resegregate? How did they stop that? How Okay, well, how they stopped it was they they. Uh, I think you know. I'm not sure if I'm the expert on this, but um, they had to create a strong enough interwoven community to resist white flight, and nobody else had been able to resist white flight before. So you had to ha you had to. You couldn't force white people not to leave. You had to encourage them not to leave, you know. And and even as you're being open and welcoming to black families coming in, so you had to do both. And it was a tricky thing. And mm -hmm. and we the did the housing center. The housing center was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, housing center would take people. Their main job, I think, was to take people to the east part of town and show them these big, grand old um, apartments that were fairly cheap in order to... Um, people could buy whatever they You can't stop somebody right, yeah. from doing that. Yeah. So they would... The housing center didn't charge anything. And they would um, talk to the, you know, to the right. clients about what was going on and what was available in different parts. And you're right, they tried to show black couples um, the western right. end of Oak Park right. and white couples the eastern end. That was the... Right. Without resorting to like quotas and things like that, although the multifamily buildings were encouraged to maintain a certain percentage of mm -hmm. diversity. You know, it's like this is all... And then there, of course, it was the equity assurance. Which we were just talking about, mm -hmm. and uh, which was considered the turning point, where they actually took out insurance policies, and if people were scared about losing the equity in their house, uh, with African Americans moving in, that they could recoup their loss, their imagined losses, if they had this insurance policy. Nobody ever filed a, compl a claim. I think one person. Uh Took it out. Nobody, nobody ever claimed it. But okay. I think one person took out the equity insurance. It was called. Yeah, equity assurance. Assurance. Yeah. But it, but it involved an insurance wow. policy. Yeah. And that is considered like the turning point. It because whether it's racist or not, people were scared of losing their housing value. If you could if you could reassure them that they were not going to lose their housing value, they were more likely to stay. Yeah. And that was. And I don't remember the percentage, but it could have been something like that you could sell it for 90% of what you paid for it. Mm -hmm. And if it was, you had a, if you sold it for less than that, then that's where the, the, okay. uh, the assurance kicks in and the, the village would pay the difference. Yeah. It's it through the village? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But it was, it, it was proposed by a group of um, women that were meeting and talking about um, what's going on in the village and would have people from the village talk to the group of them. Yes, um, Sherwin Reed was part of that yeah. and Bobby Raymond and Marge Greenwald. A lot, of, a lot of names of people who have been very involved over the years. First Tuesday it was called. So yeah, first I remember Bobby Raymond said if the diversity level gets over a certain percent, I, I don't remember if she said 10% or what, that that's when it gets more negative that people can't handle that much change or something like that? Well, there was a fear there was going to be a tipping point, and that has not come to pass. And Bobby Rennan came up well, with the idea of the housing center as part of a uh, right. master's project. Oh. Yeah. Do you happen to remember how much inch, uh, you had to pay to get, to get the assurance <coughs> that if you lost one? I, I don't, but it wasn't. wasn't but you see how interesting Old Park is. I mean, you start talking about this stuff, and it's like no other town does this or has. You know, or there may be a few now. I don't know. You know, elsewhere, uh, Shaker Heights in Cleveland was always cited as something similar. But uh, you know, Oak Park just just 
way more interesting in a lot of these areas because they did take on the challenges. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what would Hemingway have thought? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I want, you know, he died in 61, right. at the age of 62, I think, right? Something like that. And it's, and uh, if he had come home, if he could have come home, he might, you know, he might have been pretty impressed by the, uh, <laughs> because, because the open housing movement started in 1963 with a controversial concert by the Symphony of Oak Park River Forest, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, they, 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 uh, there was a, a black violinist who came in to play. She wasn't really gonna play, she was just, she was just um, uh, gonna, going to learn a particular piece because she was in a different orchestra with the director of, the, of our symphony. Okay, so anyway, it, this blew up, you know, and every, uh, the, the, uh, a number of the, um, the board of the symphony, which was made up mostly of musicians, I think, said, oh, we're, Oak Park's not ready for this. Oak Park's not ready for this. <laughs> and they made total fools of themselves, and eventually Carol Anderson did play and there was a standing ovation, and you know it was a, a real turning point. And after that, people started getting together and talking about open housing. And then they had that that ad that I talked about, and um, and then it took off. So you know we've we've got a very interesting history. We can't forget it, but we can't be complacent. We have to keep moving forward and taking on the new challenges, and it's. That's Oak Park. That's a big deal. Yeah, and you know you have a, t a lot, a lot of essays on seasons changing and Oak Park. And again, I kind of it really struck me as just well. I'll just read this one part here um, that uh, I thought was really great because it reminded me of something. Um, sitting on a friend, you wrote about porches and how people mm -hmm. sit on porches and how, and you said that you know further out people have decks. You're mm -hmm. right, and uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, David um, Axelrod. Yeah, right. Said that he lived in. Oak yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, and he said yeah. that those other communities are are it's back deck duck land. communities. Yeah, and, and Oak Park is a front porch yeah. community. Yeah, and, and it's it, like it's like that's part of the interpersonal infrastructure. Well, and as you, you know, know, probably <laughs> people used to dress up. Okay, and I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia, so I would hear these stories from my grandfather, and uh, people used to uh, dress up in the evening, put on a little bow tie, and go out and sit on the porch and greet people. Yeah. And, and I'm sure at some time in Oak Park, probably the 1880s, 1890s, right. people would do yeah. it too, because a couple of reasons. One, it was hot, right? Yeah. So you'd get on the porch so you could cool down. Right. And then it was a social occasion, you know, uh, people would stream by and they'd talk. So again, it's that, that sort of community thing. We had a porch in Oak Park, our house was 1892. And then we moved out, um, our house has a porch you can land a jet on, and we're one of the few people. Everybody else has stone houses, yeah, with decks in the back, right. you know. And then we built a patio, and most people don't have patios, so they have decks, you know, which are. And who would have who thought that these Victorians would contribute to this interpersonal infrastructure? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it come, it pays off. It paid off. You know, having people out in front where you could see each other, and and community building community, which you know, um, which I, I say community is our immunity from divisive polarization, because uh, the more we see each other, the more we interact, the less fear there is, and you know, that's how all communities should be. You know, it's like... Agreed. Well, and I think the digital age, too, has exacerbated so much isolation, so much loneliness. Right. Um, people, again, out where I am, people are very podular. They come home, the garage goes up, they go in, the garage goes down, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I walked this... Locked and loaded for the night, you know, and <laughs> you don't see anybody, you're like, 
are there people in these homes? I don't think so. <laughs> I walk uh, the sidewalks a lot, and I never have the sidewalks to myself. Sometimes I wish I did, but you know. That, uh, but there are people out, you know, and and most of the time they're tethered to a dog. But still, <laughs> there are an awful lot of dogs in this town. Yeah, yeah. A lot of your stories are you, you're walking down the sidewalk, just taking things in. Yes. And uh, and here's one where uh, we kind of you 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 have the whole porch thing going. Sitting on a friend's porch, eating rhubarb pie, served warm, spooning a black cow at a table outside Peterson's ice cream parlor on a hot Sunday afternoon, the subtle scent of catalpa blossoms and the heavy perfume of lindens blended and suspended in the thick night air, mulberries crushed on the sidewalk, staining the concrete purple, the chilly AC blast passing open shop doors, wildflowers taking over highway roadsides, Swimmers flip-flopping home from the original commons or Ream Park pools. Surrounded by towels, morning and afternoon clatches, great word, outside scattered coffee shops. Actors spraying their spittle in the stage-like glow of a Shakespearean evening. Crickets trilling and dogs sounding alerts as pedestrians pass on a walk down streets. Densely overhung by trees, accompanied by the scattershot brilliance of flyer fireflies in the evening dusk, standing on a rooftop deck, dwarfed by an ocean of air, the departed sun reflecting off coral reefs and shining sandbars of clouds as swallows dart to and fro, skimming mosquitoes, period. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was all one sentence, all right? <laughs> You really got to work on that and get some sentences and commas in that. Um, what I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which which was just great. It's such a great riff, and it sums up. I mean, I, again, I, I went to Peterson's a lot and my kids and all that stuff, and it made me also remember one time I was sitting outside. Is it Dressel's uh, Hardware Store there? Yeah, they still there. Right. Okay. Um, and it was. Oh. It's now Ace. Oh, it's now oh Ace. yeah, right, right, right. Because right, right. yeah. Chuck died, and and uh, uh, it was my day. To, we had a nanny for three days, and my wife took my son one day. And I took him the other, and it was my day. And so we rode our bikes up there, um, and we were sitting there um, on the bench, um, having some uh, pop and uh, potato chips and things like that. And this guy walked by, and my son was probably you know, was five, six, whatever, and he goes. Enjoy it because it's going to pass like that. Wow. And I thought, you're oh. crazy. There's no <laughs> way this will go on forever. And now I'm like, oh, he was right. Yeah. yeah. That's a community moment. It is. And uh, I, there was a guy I wrote about in the eulogies um, at the end, Jack Levering, who used to sit in, uh, he was at Brookdale, and he sat in the park, uh, Austin Gardens, on a bench. And every time people would pass him, he'd say, you're late. <laughs> uh, and, you know, some people would be moving a little faster, some people would be like laughing, and I sat down on the bench and talked to him, of course, and he turned out to be an amazing character. And that's like the guy who gave the hugs out. Oh no, that's different. That's, that, that's a, that, okay. Yeah, but but yeah, that's that an amazing that story. That guy. Yeah, that, that guy just set up on at the corner of uh, at the entrance to Scoville Park with free hugs. And, you know, he didn't know if anybody was going to come up, and they did. It turned out to be a really good thing. He was just a, a musician who, you know, had lived in Nashville, I guess, and he said people were friendlier down there, and he's like, I want to see people friendlier here. You know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, if folk parkers are not friendly or... Well, he, you, said are, in your, you said in your, uh, your piece that, you know, some people got weirded out. Yeah. Some people were like, what, what are you doing? Yeah, and you know, and I gave him his first hug. Yeah, and and one woman said, "Don't you have anybody that you know to hug you?" Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, no, I probably not. I don't know. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that was great. And then you had this thing on Hemingway, back circling back around to okay. Ernie. Um, you know Hemingway's tragic heroism. Um, and there's something I want to read from there. Okay, do you want to do this? Want to yeah. Do it? yeah, yeah, yeah. My book's falling apart. Go ahead. Which I love. I don't know if, if uh, you saw this uh, when uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick did the uh, Hemingway series. Sure. Um, they had a promotional thing. I don't know if you were 
in on that, the yeah. Zoom mm -hmm. things, which were really cool. It was in, during the pandemic, I think. It was. And, um, and so they had a number of people talking about it. I learned so much about Hemingway and came to sympathize with him in spite of all of his outrageousness. Um, much more, but they actually had Joyce Carol Oates at one point, and there was a discussion about how people were, you know, critical of Hemingway for committing suicide and, and um, other things, and uh, how he was obsessed by suicide his whole life, I guess. But anyway, this is what she said. I thought it was really insightful and sympathetic. I think we are expecting something of him that he was not able to provide. His father had committed suicide. He was deeply insecure. He made out of the material of his life a very beautiful and lasting monument to just getting through it. He lived to be about 62 and then he killed himself. But he might have died much younger. There is something heroic in these people enduring as long as they did, especially Hemingway, who was haunted by the possibility of dying by suicide all through his life. And I just thought that was really... Yeah. Uh, it, it just made me change a lot of my view of, of Hemingway. I, I actually thought it had something to do with the blood disease. His father had it and then... He had a lot of stuff going against him. Yeah, I mean, he, he had a... He had a disease that was particularly susceptible to alcoholism, so that couldn't have helped at all. And <laughs> called drinkitis. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess alcoholism is a disease too. But anyway, this is that probably contributed to his father's suicide. They think it did. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, his father was uh, bipolar, probably. Okay. And so that didn't help either. Yeah, and stuff has been running through the Hemingway family ever since. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the younger ones. So, you know, he had a struggle. He had a rough time. And yet, in spite of all that, he was a hell of a writer. He succeeded. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I was very surprised when I came back to Oak Park and started covering some of that and read some of them. And I was like, oh, man, this is really good. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, he had been blown off by so many people, you know, and dismissed as a, you know, bloviating, uh, you know, self-centered maniac or something. But anyway. You know, for his writing, he never went to college. Yeah, and right. I, I think yeah. it was OPRF. It must have been such a great high school that it was almost like a college. And his parents obviously read a lot. Yeah. So. Yes, and he read a lot. He did. And we went to... Think of Vihia, yeah. I'm not sure it's funny, in, in uh, San, San Francisco de Paula. And there are books everywhere, including from Oak Park Library. Right. That's right. Yeah. They found some that he had. He did eventually, I think, send them some money. He and, did. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm pretty sure I didn't return all the books I borrowed. Yeah, right, yeah. It was a hundred bucks, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, he's kind of a tragic figure, I think. I think he was a remarkable person, tremendous strengths, tremendous weaknesses, you know, as much at fault for his downfall as, you know, uh, um, the Greek heroes. <laughs> and, uh, and yet, he did some amazing writing. So I, I really... Uh, Anyway, this yeah. might be a good time to read the other one. I was going to say, go, go for it. Why don't you, probably at the point where why don't you do some reading and then if people have questions and yeah. things like that. So, um, let's see. Okay. Um, this is maybe my favorite piece in the, uh, in the book, uh, and it's a fantasy in case anybody was wondering. Um, <laughs> but it's also lighthearted, and, uh, and I just had fun writing it. And this happened after um, the last Fiesta de Hemingway, right? 1999 was mm -hmm. the centennial of the last one. Anyway, and I, I have written several columns 
you know, urging the village and, and the foundation and whoever else is needed to get together and, do, and resurrect Fiesta de Hemingway. And I know there's a lot working against it, but that would be a great thing to have the third week of July every year in this town, um, if we could swing it. But anyway, so the Centennial was their best and last, I guess. Um, Fiesta de Hemingway, they had was that when they had these guys making a big triangle uh, of, you know, dressed in Spanish white outfits, you know, from... Um, anyway. All, that, all three of the sons were... Yes, yeah, I was... I was yeah. Front yeah, I was here for that. Um, and they did this really corny uh, running with the bulls, but, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, they were trying to have fun, and so that's good. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> so anyway, I wrote this, and I titled it, of course, The Old Man and the Sangria. <laughs> <laughs> it was late. Good Hemingway there. Yes. <laughs> Scoville Park had never looked worse. <laughs> Prostrate bodies everywhere. The Centennial Fiesta de Hemingway had turned into Siesta de Hemingway. Everyone had too much sangria, <laughs> including me, come to think of it. In fact, things were looking pretty fuzzy by the time the old man sat down on the bench next to me. He looked tired, beat. He looked like he had just lost a Hemingway look-alike contest. <laughs> hey, old man, I said in my friendliest manner, what's wrong? You look like hell. I just lost the Hemingway look-alike contest, he said. <laughs> Hard to believe, I told him. He was a dead ringer, so to speak. <laughs> Turns out he lost on the Desert Island tiebreaker question. Which modernist author would you most like to be stranded on a desert island with? I answered Gertrude Stein. <laughs> they laughed so hard I lost my temper. I used a word with more than two syllables and they disqualified me. <laughs> Life just isn't fair. Clearly, the old man was more than a look-alike. He was impersonating Hemingway's very soul. I decided to play along. What would the great DiMaggio say? I heard him mutter, sadly, to no one in particular. A nation turns its lonely eyes to you, I replied. Sorry, that song came out after you died. He looked at me with so much conviction, I felt I'd better change the subject. What do you think of the, the, the old town? It's been a while since you were here. All so different, he said, shaking his shaggy comb over. When did they put up that war memorial? I believe it was 1925. It's called Peace Triumphant. You had already moved on. Your name is on it, though. I don't get it, he said. The lawn seems so much narrower and the mines so much Oh, sorry, the long seam so much narrower and the mines much too broad. <laughs> Since when is a prophet honored in his own land? This isn't your father's all-America city, I offered helpfully. He scratched his beard and muttered, somewhere along the line, the century passed me by. Don't despair, I said cheerfully. They made a lot of progress in chronic depression. A little physical therapy, a little Prozac, and you'd be back at your typewriter pounding away in no time. <laughs> of course, you might want to invest in a laptop. <laughs> Very useful. You could even take it on safari. No good, he said. Computers tempt writers to say more than they need to. They get carried away. I've been meaning to ask, I interjected, why such short clipped sentences? The main thing wrong with the world, he replied, then and now, is phoniness. Too many write too much and don't say enough. I went after what's real. I wouldn't put a word down until it spoke to me first. Isn't that what art and artists are supposed to be about, the search for what's real? You mean authenticity? Too many syllables. 
<laughs> Did you find what was real? A lot of people claim I turned into a phony, a victim of my own image making, but not my writing. There's no fat in it. Have you found anything real back here in Oak Park? They tell me the town showed grace under pressure in the decades after I died. <laughs> Wish I could have seen that. What do you think what do you think of your 100th birthday bash? They like me, he said, shaking his craggy head. They really like me. As he limped off into the night, I felt for him. I called out, but the sun also rises. <laughs> then I heard him from a distance. Isn't it pretty to think so? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> You gotta have fun. Pretty much nailed it. Anybody have any questions for Ken or about anything? Yes. How much does your book cost? <laughs> Twenty four ninety nine. Which is only because um, self publishing is kind of a racket. You, it's a hard way to make money, <laughs> and uh, they charge way too much to, you know, to produce the books and all that. So it's. If I break even, I'll be lucky. But uh, it doesn't matter. It's out there, and that's what I'm happy about. I'm really sorry. I missed. Uh, you said in 2013 you wrote a book, uh, Vatican and Catholicism. About the Vatican, about Vatican II, about a, a class of um, future priests who um, arrived in Rome a week before Vatican II started in 1962. And they left like a few weeks after it ended in 1965. And um, there was, it was an earth-shaking change in the Catholic Church. Um, and if they had kept going, that church would be in much better shape now. But they didn't. But anyway, it was, it was interesting to talk to these guys and how it changed their lives. Um, a lot of them came out of there convinced that they were going to get rid of celibacy. And when they didn't, a lot of them left. Mm -hmm. And um, these are really, you know, accomplished people, very smart. And the church is way poorer because of that. You know, they just, they wouldn't even let them teach um, uh, CCD, religious instruction, in, uh, uh, in the schools, you know, kind of Sunday school, just mm -hmm. because they had left the church or left uh, the priesthood. So it's like, uh, will they ever learn? Anyway, yeah, that's what I, that was my previous book. Yeah, I'd like to read that one. They have it at the library, do they? Uh, they may, I'm not book sure. Book table can order it. Uh, book table can order it. I think it's still available through Amazon. Okay. So, um, yeah, Google it and see what's, I, I obviously haven't checked in a while. <laughs> <laughs> And what's the uh, what's your take on the, the sort of decline of print journalism in the last mm. five or ten years? Um, is I read a piece not long ago that really kind of uh, was an obituary to the print yeah. mm. uh, to the print newspaper, especially in smaller communities. Right. Uh, and even here, um, you know, we've we've seen some shifts, I guess, in, in uh, the way the Wednesday Journal is put together. Right, yes, definitely. We, so what, uh, what's going on from your perspective? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not up on a lot of it, but I, um, there will always be people who like print, so there will probably always be print versions, but more and more people get, uh, read it online. Um, and uh, I don't know if that changes how people write. I suppose it does. Um, if we're losing some of the ability to to produce, you know, quality writing, um, I, I suspect the online uh, streamlines the process. So they just want to get they call it content, you know, right. instead of writing. <laughs> and uh, 
And uh, so I think it's bound to become shallower and, and maybe less interesting. Um, and um, that would be a real shame. Uh, you know, the, and, and then now there's the whole arrival of chat GPT right. and AI, and will that shallow out writing even more? Um, it, uh, it takes a commitment, you know, it's like uh, the journal has always been, it's been easy to beat the competition because um, the competition is really mediocre. Um, or sub mediocre, and um, and so we were always. I, I never said we were great. I said we were above average, and above average is way ahead of yeah. where most newspapers are. Yeah. And I and I keep saying, you know, if we want people to donate and keep us alive, we have to make it so compelling that they can't help themselves. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping will happen with the journal. Mm -hmm now in the future. Um, print is, the main drawback of print in a, in a business where you make a hell of a lot of mistakes is that you can't change print <laughs> once it's made. But you can go online and change it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, you know, that endears me to online just because we can correct some of the goofy things that happen. But um, I like print. I like reading it. You know, when people send me interesting articles online, I tend to print them out and read them at my yeah. leisure. You know, <laughs> which, <laughs> so anyway, I'm not sure where it's going. Um, maybe we can start away from that. Uh, one of the pieces in your book was on the magic tree. Oh, yeah. And uh, since Iris is sitting right here, <laughs> and uh, we can all interact. Um, uh, bookstores in Oak Park, um, what, we're down to the book table, is that yeah, pretty right. much it, right? They were the survivor, and, they beat and, all the and, corporate and, Right, so you had Barbers at one time, and you had, you know, board, Borders just died because they all died. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then we had Magic Tree, Crocs and Potatoes, so, so I guess it's sort of interesting to see the viewpoint of, you know, what's the future there? I mean, here's this little town of very artistic town, a lot of writers, yeah. right? Just loaded of writers. Right. Um, uh, Literature is held high, mm -hmm. for good or for bad. And so, of all towns, you would think this one would, you know, really foster having, you know, a lot of bookstores, hmm. or at least some. But we're really down. You're down to one. There was one. Uh, looking less. Yeah, looking. Okay. That's down on South Oak Park Avenue, right? Okay. Yeah. Two. Okay. So, so I know. What's yeah. the, I guess the same whole kind of segue into what he was saying about, you know, decline of print journalism, and and uh, you know, so I guess publishing in general, right? Sort of thoughts on that. Um, I like bookstores, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, like book tables. Uh, is uh, <laughs> seems to be just going great guns. I don't know, if, you know, um, what their business is like, but I uh, tried to make sure that I had my books there, and and um, I what I, I tell people to go to book table mm, before okay. I tell them to go to Amazon. You know, right. if, if you're you know if somebody can't get out, then I tell them Amazon. But um, I much prefer having people go in, and uh, you know, there's something. Even if it's just going past the window and looking at, at mm -hmm. the books in the mm -hmm. window, um, or just if you have a few minutes to kill, it's going in there and looking at the books on the table. And um, I love that about uh, bookstores. And you could rummage through, you know, catalogs online, I guess, but it's just not the same. I would agree, and I think the most interesting thing uh, in publishing is that. Uh, the Kindle died. I mean, it's there, but yeah, right. in terms of revenue streams, um, yeah, all my books are hardcovers. So and there are Kindles too, but the Kindle didn't. People thought the iPodification of books was going to occur. 
Mm -hmm. that, you know, after the iPod came out and, you know, and then AirBuds and everything, people would just be ripping books and that's how it was and print was dead. It was just a matter of time, right? But people who read books are extremely different from people who listen to music, mm -hmm. you know? It's just, it's a different experience you engage. And so then the Kindle came along and everybody, oh, wow, this is, this is it, you know, this is going to kill it off. But... <laughs> People don't want to be on computer screens. Yeah, and they, they they yeah. don't they don't want that. Right. Yeah. And I spend a lot of time in no offense here in Barnes and Noble, and uh, um, and when people come in, the books uh, and Barnes and Noble too, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course it is. Um, and here at the Hemingway gift shop. That's right. And the Hemingway right. gift shop. Exactly. Which, which is even better. Which, which is right. even better. Which is even better. Um, but right. when people come in. Um, they don't bat an eye at the price. I mean, to buy when they buy these books, which, you know, thirty-four, thirty-six dollars, right? And hmm. um, so, uh, people who read are just diff are very different, and and you know, print's just gone way up. I mean, and they start, people are certainly publishing a lot of books. They're publishing a lot of books because publishing's doing very, very well. I mean, Amazing. you know, they're, they're making a lot of money now, and it's just because it. People did not move away to these other technologies, and yeah. and, uh, and you know, and they're still willing to pay. Yeah. Which I and then it brings up the whole thing of demographics because my daughter and I talk a lot. She's she's 17, so we talk about this at times, and I'll say, you know, you should read that book, uh, The Great Gatsby. Uh, you know, and all this, and <laughs> you know, she'll be sitting on TikTok zooming through, and and uh, she's I go, well, you should get that. You know, you should buy that. She goes, I have to buy it. Like yeah, yeah, you gotta buy it, and she's like, we don't buy anything, we just download it. And so yeah, I right. thought about you know Music that too. that you know, demographic is now you know um, not getting ages so weird, but you know of that age, they're used to just free, mm -hmm. it's free. I I want it free, you know, and and uh, you know she's she's not used to plopping down money for her entertainment, so. Yeah. You know. I think everybody has to have that one experience where a book just sweeps you away. Yeah, I agree. And, and if you're just reading, you know, the, the syllabus books in high school, you know, and you're kind of forcing your way through it, you're not going to become a reader. But once you get that experience, Agreed. it's like, well, there must be other ones out there. So yeah, <laughs> this one's good. Let's look. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Anything else for Ken? Yes. Since you had so many columns, how did you decide what to put in the book? Uh, that's a really good question. Whenever anybody says that, it's because they don't know the answer. <laughs> 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 so they're buying time. Um, I think they uh, just enough of them sprang to mind. I had I had uh, this was this is 344 pages. And when it, when I was finished with the uh, the uh, um, manuscript on Word, it said it was like 280 pages. And then when it came out, or when my the person who was helping me came, uh, checked it out, it was going to be 450 pages in a book. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, that's different. So I had to cut over 100 pages. Mm. Of stuff, so I had a lot of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, um, including two pieces about Hemingway. Um, I, I had four yeah. there. By the way, there's two pieces on Hemingway in this book and one on Wright. So there. Um, but anyway. We got that one right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, some of it was guided by the fact that uh, our town was was a part of this whole thing. And when I say our town, Oak Park, I mean our town, the play, or at least that's an allusion to it. And um, so I, I modeled it on some of that. There's a time capsule. There is a bunch of eulogies instead of the cemetery scene in Act Three, if you're familiar with with our town and other things. So. And I had to limit it to like, I just forced myself to limit it to no more than like 10 per chapter. Um, for a long time, 
it was the columns that um, made me tear up at the end that got me a little bit emotional that that was the uh, the criterion for getting into the uh, into the book and um, and some of them are, were just my favorites I you know one of the ways I was able to do this was I painstakingly archived my columns uh, over the years so I had these big cheaply bound you know um, uh, stacks of columns and I was able to go through them and oh yeah that one oh yeah that one and that helped to get into the you know if you if I didn't have that it would have been I wouldn't have had this book so it's and a lot of columnists tell me that they don't do that they they don't archive their columns and it's like really yeah yeah so anyway, that was uh, pretty much how it went. Um, and um, I regret some of the things I had to cut, but there was that conversation I had with the squirrel in Austin Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that column. I don't know if anybody else would have loved it, but I, I did. And uh, it was a one-sided conversation, mind you. <laughs> but, but he was listening. He was there. He wasn't going away. Anyway, blowing. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think it would probably have to be a different one. You know, it's like I've thought about. I've written a lot about spirituality in my column. I mean, I I push the envelope all the time and break all the rules and column writing. <laughs> and so um, I've done a lot uh, in a spiritual vein, and I thought that might be a way to capture or aggregate my spirituality in one place for passing it on, you know. Some of these things are kind of legacy projects, but but I did not want this book to be um, just a compilation of columns. And I didn't want it to be just about me. So I had to try to reduce my presence. You can't do it entirely because it's a personal column, but um, it, I, it had to be more. And that's really where my emphasis on community came in. Uh, and the idea of true community is like this had to be, this had to be about a park. Mm. Um, and um, what I really learned uh, through all this is how much I, I knew I loved Oak Park. I didn't know how much I loved Oak Park oh. and how proud I am to be from this town and how much it's influenced me. So I, I like to say that this book was a return on Oak Park's investment in me and a return on my investment in Oak Park. Oh, great. So. Well, I think that's a good note to end on, huh? Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>